Hey everyone, we are continuing this week in our series on hearing God. Now, I know that we've been interrupted because of this coronavirus, and very likely this will be the last message in that series. But I want to take a few minutes just to review, to get us all on the same page before we launch out into a passage of Scripture that I think will be very insightful and encouraging to you. Uh, as we look at that together. So, early in 2020, we had this heart to really seek the Lord, to know Him in a deeper and more personal way. And part of that would require us to be more in tune with His voice. Now, in conjunction with a variety of, of different me uh, messages and different passages of Scripture, we looked at various ways that God communicates. I'm hoping that you'll remember that the primary way that the Lord speaks to us today is through what He has already written. Now, the Holy Spirit moved the, the pen, so to speak, of the 40 or so uh, people who wrote the Bible and has preserved the scriptures as a accurate testimony of God's activity among mankind. And so the scriptures are thousands of years old and they've been preserved for us so that we can gain an, a, uh, an accurate and clear picture of who God is, of what he's like, and what he requires. And so the first message that we looked at dealt with the scriptures and the word of God as the primary means by which God communicates. Now, just as the Holy Spirit was active back then and there, he's also active today. And I, I label this the living word. And what the Holy Spirit does is he takes our knowledge of what is written in the scriptures. And as we read, as we study, He's able to take those general principles and enable us to apply them today in our culture, in our specific context, according to what's been going on, maybe for guidance, for encouragement. And so I call that the living word of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he is still present and he still speaks to God's children today, offering them guidance, wisdom, encouragement, uh, etc., for their needs. Now, we also did a message on the theme of prayer, not just speaking to God or making requests known, but also listening, listening for the Lord to speak. Uh, we looked at how the Holy Spirit can speak through other people. And there are various examples of this in the scriptures. And of course, just in practical everyday life. If the Holy Spirit lives in me and he lives in other believers, then the Holy Spirit can speak through each one of us at times to provide counsel, to provide wisdom, to provide encouragement or help to other people in the body of Christ. God can even use individuals who are not saved and do not know him to speak a timely word that's needed, that's necessary in the life of a believer. Now, we didn't cover these additional methods or means in which God is able to communicate, but there are certainly a plethora of them in Scripture. Psalm 19 talks about God communicating through creation. Daniel chapter 9 speaks of God communicating through angels. And that's a, that's a large one in Scripture. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, if you look at the last chapter in Revelation, John is receiving insight from an angel about what is to come in the future. Uh, Amos chapter 3 is an example of how God speaks through prophets. Uh, he also speaks through dreams, evidenced by Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. Visions. God can speak through visions. Ezekiel chapter 37 would be a great example of God speaking through a vision. Um, casting of lots. That's in Joshua chapter 7. God speaks directly 
When we look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, he can speak through signs, wonders, and miracles. Uh, he spoke to Moses through a burning bush. And he spoke to Balaam in Numbers chapter 22 through a donkey. Just a supernatural means of opening a donkey's mouth and speaking to Balaam in that context. And of course, we spent a message looking at Moses entering the tent of meeting and, and engaging in uh, a relationship, a conversation with God in the tent of meeting face to face. Today, we're going to look at um, a very unique way that God had prescribed in the Old Testament for leaders to seek him and to gain guidance, um, especially concerning decision making. And that's going to be found here in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So if you have your Bible, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. I have, to, I have to give you some context here before we get started. Um, but we're going to look at another example of how important it is to hear from God and how God can communicate to us in the midst of the things that we face in everyday life. Okay, so 1 Samuel chapter 30, in my Bible, it's entitled David Destroys the Amalekites, and we're going to talk about King David before he was crowned king. And here's the context. David is approximately 30 years old when we pick up here in verse, uh, verse 1, chapter 30. He is currently an outlaw, with the Philistines. He's been hunted and by King Saul of Israel, and he has left the territory of Israel to go into Philistine country. He's currently hiding and living as an outlaw, and he has proved himself a valuable servant of one of the Philistine kings. Now, inevitably, David probably knew this was going to, going to occur, the Philistines go to war against Israel. David and his 600 companions are Israelites. And they join with the Philistine army to go against their former king, King Saul. David doesn't want to do this. None of the 600 warriors want to do this. They're really in a tight bind. But on the day or the eve before battle, the Philistine lords get together and they say, Hey, I think this is a liability. We should not have David and his men fight with us because the best way for them to redeem themselves in the eyes of their former master, King Saul, would be to switch in the heat of the battle and to, to turn on us and to fight against us. So we've got to let David and his men go, go back home. And that's reported to uh, one of the Philistine lords who's in charge of David. And he basically says, David, there's nothing we can do. You'd be a liability. We've collectively decided to send you back home. And David and his men are looking at about a 55-mile journey by foot back to their town where their wives, children, livestock, possessions were kept called uh, Ziklag. So we're going to pick up in... Verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 30, let's read together. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. So let me stop there and just share a couple points. It said David and his men reached their hometown, Ziklag, on the third day. I don't know how many miles they traveled. It was about 55 from the scene of battle preparation to get back home. Did they do about 20 miles a day? Sounds reasonable to me. They reached it on the third day, maybe doing 15 on that last and final day. And it says that the Amalekites, which was a kingdom, an enemy kingdom that lived to the south and to the east of Israel, you might want to look that up on a map, had raided 
the Negev and Ziklag, basically that territory, that area. Now, this was probably in retaliation for many of the raids that David had performed in the, in the last year and a half. If you want to read about those, they can be found in chapter 27. But David had raided territory of the Amalekites, and every time he raided, he killed man, woman, child, everyone. So there was no survivors, and there was no one to report back to the Amalekite king what he was doing. So this was probably in response to David and his men. The Amalekites set out. They attack Philistine territory, and they attack uh, territory in southern Israel, where David is at as well. And they had taken captive all the wives, children, the possessions, and the livestock. They didn't kill any of them. They had taken them as plunder. Verse 3, when David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking about stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because his sons and daughters were gone. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Now that is a very key phrase, that last phrase, and I want to want to share more about that. You know, often we feel like we're alone in the problems that we face. And I talked about this in a video earlier this week. Um, but David was a very interesting character in Scripture, and he experienced a tremendous amount of suffering, trials, difficulties, and pain in life. For about 15 years of his early life, before the age of 30, before he was anointed king, he was hunted down, and he lived in caves, he lived in desert, he fled, and he ran for his life. He was an outlaw for much of that time. David experienced the tremendous um, atrocity of, of multiple battles throughout his life. He experienced the death of his children. One son rebelled against him when he was older and tried to murder David and took over the kingdom for a time. And you can imagine the leadership problems that David faced in trying to shepherd a population of millions of people in Israel once he became king. And if you go back and you think back to when David was just a shepherd boy, even something as simple as loneliness, of being out on the slopes watching the sheep with the potential predators around, just loneliness was another trial that David had gone through as well. So David was a man who was used to difficulties and trials, and yet this incident was probably the most significant thing or one of the most significant things he had faced. Here's the interesting thing. This last phrase, David found strength in the Lord his God, tells us that when David faced an issue, I have this picture in my mind of David going away Tears are coming down his eyes, you know, flowing from his eyes. He, he finds a isolated spot. He's crying out to the Lord from the depths of his heart, probably not much vocally, but he's just crying out, God, why? What do you want me to do? The, the, the pain, the depth of that moment was, was significant. Now, I think about this, and I've meditated on this this week. David found strength in the Lord his God. How? What, what did that look like back then? Now, David had had interaction with Samuel after he had killed Goliath at the, at the age of about 16. He was invited to be part of King Saul's, King Saul's palace um, and his essentially leadership team. He was a commander in the army for a time in his 20s. And David probably would have had access to the first five books of Moses including Joshua, Judges, and perhaps Ruth. So some 
of the earliest scriptures would have been available to him. And I think of David, perhaps he had memorized a portion of scripture. Perhaps he had a portion on him. And David going off by himself in a place of isolation, crying out to the Lord in prayer, shedding tears, and perhaps slipping a piece of paper out of his, uh, his pocket maybe something that he kept with him, something that was an encouragement to him. And I just want to read one uh, one passage of Scripture, just a couple verses that would have been available to David. And I envision David pulling out a passage of Scripture like this and just finding strength in the Lord his God and what had been previously recorded and written about who God was and what he was like. So let me grab my flip in my Bible here, and I want to read for you Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Here's Joshua chapter 1, 5 through 9. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do all according to the law of Moses, my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have success wherever you go. Now, obviously, this passage is written to Joshua, who was the new commander that took over from Moses uh, hundreds of years before David. But this passage, perhaps the Holy Spirit used it to speak to David's situation directly. Um, it says, be strong and courageous. No man shall be able to stand before you. If you follow me and you follow my guidance, you will have success. And it says, I will not leave nor forsake you. And it kind of provides just in a few short verses, a means of encouragement for David that may have helped him in this situation. Now, David had already been anointed as the next king of Israel. That, was, that took place at about the age of 16, before he killed Goliath with the sling and the stone. He was anointed by Samuel, next king of Israel. But here he is, running for his life as an outlaw, being hunted down for the better part of over 10 years, and he's going through all of these trials, all of these difficulties. Here's another difficulty that ro rolls around. And yet, I picture him taking the word of God and finding encouragement and hope in God's promises. And what the word of God says. What the word of God has encouraged to others, the Holy Spirit can use to encourage him. Let's pick up in verse 7. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord. That's a significant phrase. He asked two questions. Shall I pursue this raiding party? And secondly, will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. Now, let me share something about the ephod. David had the high priest at the time with him. Now Saul had turned away from the Lord. He was, he was going in a different direction. He was not following God's truth. The high priest had accompanied David. The ephod was a garment that was worn over the high priest, linen garment. It was decorated. And over the garment was the breastplate worn by the high priest, which had 12 significant stones symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel, and there was a pouch on the breastplate holding two very interesting objects. Uh, scholars really don't know what these objects were exactly. Were they dice? Were they some sort of stones? But they're called the Yorim and the Thorim, or the Thummim. The Yorim, Yorim, Yorim and the Thorm, Thummim, sorry. And these two objects were used to discern God's will for simple decision-making issues. And you'll notice here he asked two questions. He says, number one, shall I pursue this raiding party? 
And number two, will I overtake them? Both yes or no questions. The thought is that Abiathar used the Urim and Thummim to basically uh, roll the dice, so to speak, and find out a yes or no answer to these two questions. Pursue them, yes, pursue them. And secondly, yes, you will overtake them. And the thought is, or the assumption is, you'll succeed in the rescue. Now, what's really interesting is that while David is pursuing the Lord and, and seeking the Lord through the, the a rightfully prescribed manner, chronologically, at this exact same time, King Saul is engaged on the night of battle uh, before the Philistines, with the Philistines, in chapter 28, reread of Saul actually consulting a witch um, and pursuing insight from a demon concerning what guidance is available on the eve of battle. So while David is following the prescribed method at this time of seeking God's will, King Saul, this is an indication that he had long departed from the path of the Lord, was actually pursuing guidance through a witch and through a demonic realm um, concerning insight as to what stance he should take and, and what choices he should make concerning the, the battle of the, the coming day. If you want to read further about that, that's in 1 Samuel chapter 28. Now, verse 9, David and the 600 men with him came to uh, Bezor, the Bezor Valley, which was about 16 miles from Ziklag, where some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. So let me just stop for a moment. You know, three days previous, they're released from the Philistine army. They travel back to Ziklag, their hometown, perhaps 20 miles the first day, 20 miles the second day, 15 miles that third day. They reach the town. They find out the town's been burned. Everything is gone. Their wives, their children, livestock, all of it has been plundered. They weep. They seek the Lord. They get an answer from the Lord. And then they immediately continue in hot pursuit. Now, the, um, the Bezor Valley was about 16 miles from Ziklag. So now we've got an additional 16 miles. I don't know exactly how much they traveled on that third day to get back home, but it says that 200 of the 600 men with David were too exhausted to continue. So David left them there in charge of the baggage. Verse 11, they found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, Who do you belong to and where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Carathites, some territory belonging to Judah, and then the Gev of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag, probably in retaliation for all that David had done. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? And he answered, only thing I want you to do, swear to me that God will not, that you will not kill me or hand me over to my former master, and I'll take you down to them. Verse 16, he led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating and drinking and reviling, reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk, which means they, you know, they arrived just as it was getting dark, until the evening of the next day. So about 24-hour period, the men are already exhausted. Somehow God supernaturally uh, encourages them, empowers them to take the fight to the enemy. And it says that none of them got away except 400 young men who rode, rode off on camels and fled. Verse 18, David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing. 
young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and the herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, This is David's plunder. Then David came to the 200 men that had been too exhausted to follow him and were left behind uh, with the baggage. They came out to meet David and the men with him. As David's men had approached, uh, some of the evil men, this is verse 22, and the troublemakers among David's followers said, because these guys didn't go out with us, they shouldn't share with the plunder. Just give them back their wives and their children and nothing else. But in verse 23, David says, no, we're not going to go this route. He says, they're brothers as well, and we're going to make an institution. We're going to make a law from this point forward that those who stay with the supplies will be the same as those who go down to battle. All will share alike. And so David made this a statute and an ordinance for Israel during his time as king. Verse 26, it says, When David reached Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, Here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. And then it goes on to list about 14 cities and other territories in which David had once roamed as an outlaw, um, hiding for his life. And these territories, these cities, the cities of Judah had kind of helped him or protected him, and thus he sent plunder to them as a gift and as a means to express thanksgiving. So, let me just share some, some thoughts here as we've concluded this passage, okay? God used this difficulty in David's life for some very important purposes. First of all, God used this difficulty to encourage David to seek him and develop a, a stronger, more intimate relationship with, with him. As David went through this trial, as he was forced to seek the Lord's will, as he was forced to rely upon the Lord for strength, for guidance, his relationship with God grew closer and matured. And that's one of the benefits of this, this trial that he faced. Secondly, David is now in possession of greater wealth. Some of the some of the cities, some of the area that had been raided by the Amalekites was Philistine territory. So David not only recovered what was taken from his particular city or town, but also the surrounding towns of Judah and of Philistine territory. So now David has amassed this huge amount of wealth because of his victory over the Amalekites. And he's now able to buy favor with Judah's elders. And the interesting thing is, is just within a matter of weeks, he's going to be proclaimed king of Judah by the very same men. So, as David is fighting the Amalekites, Saul the next day is fighting the Philistines, and Saul and his son and his bloodline all die in the battle, so there is no longer any king of Israel. In a very short time, the elders of Judah are going to say, hey, David was anointed to be the next king by Samuel. We recognize that, and we're installing him as king over our tribe at the very least. So here, all of this plunder comes in handy as David begins to buy favor and alliances with and consolidate the power of, of Judah. And it's interesting that as God kind of closes one door, his hometown was burned, Ziklag, God opens another. Within a very short time, David is moving with his 600 men, their families, to Hebron, and that is where he's being installed as the next king. And out of what seems bad, at least at the surface level, God basically reveals to David that he has a greater blessing. Not a single person was harmed, and David came away in a position that was more well-off than when he entered. 
And all of this was because David saw the Lord in a very difficult moment, and he exercised obedience to align himself with the will of God as it was revealed to him. So, let me also say this. This is not the first time that David had sought the Lord. This was a pattern in David's life. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, we read of David also seeking the Lord before he went into battle. And then even after this example, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 2 or 2 Samuel chapter 5, David continues to inquire of the Lord when he's got a major decision on his hands. So this was a pattern of David's life when he faced a significant issue. He got away with the Lord. He sought the Lord and he desired to follow uh, the Lord's leading and the Lord's guidance concerning that fork in the road. And it's kind of an encouragement to us because in difficult situations, we realize that God is sovereign. He understands all the details He's outside of time. He sees the past as well as the future. And if we'll trust him, the highest wisdom is to consult the Lord about what should be done. Uh, We're not really given a time frame regarding David's pursuit of guidance from the Lord. We don't know if it's 30 minutes. We don't know if it's three hours. In some cases, we don't know if it was a matter of days. But we do know that through this process, David was able to cultivate a more intimate, uh, deeper relationship with God. God's able to teach us to depend upon him rather than rely on our own pride or presumption for decision making. And as David sought God, he heard from God, he aligned himself with God's plan, he experienced God's favor, and God directed him toward success and victory. And so here's the, the application, at least, that I have in mind for this passage of Scripture. David's a great example of someone seeking the Lord's will, desiring to hear the voice of God, so to speak, to, desiring to walk in intimacy with the Lord, And how the Lord is more than willing to reveal himself and to respond to our pursuit by giving us clarity in in times of decision making. So here's my question. Where are you struggling today or what major decisions are you facing? Will you find your strength and guidance in Christ alone? Will you keep your eyes on Christ? Will you seek him through the word, the primary means by which God communicates his will, guidance, encouragement to us today? One of the best places I think we could start, um, just as an example here, I'm turning to Psalm 34. If you want to Just take a moment to look at a few verses. In Psalm 34, this psalm was written around the time that David experienced this difficulty. And it's very interesting that a few verses here in Psalm 34 speak almost specifically to David's difficulties and issues. And the resolution of those issues. And I want to read for you verse 6, verse 4, 15, 17 through 18. So here's verse 4 in Psalm 34. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Wow, that sounds like it applies or that David might have written it after the fact. Here's verse 6. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. That's an amazing promise of the Lord. Now look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The Lord hears the cry of the righteous. And finally, look at verse 17 through 18. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. 
The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. It seems as if those verses were written directly relating to the very trial that David had gone through. And so I want to encourage you to seek scripture as a means by which to find guidance, to build up your faith in the Lord in the midst of a decision making or trial. And maybe a good place to start is reading all of Psalm 34, since it seems to be so uh, applicable to, to David's situation and perhaps to some of your situations today. So will you find strength and guidance in Christ alone? Will you keep your eyes on him? Will you seek God through the word? Allow him to speak to you through the word. Will you listen and take time to pray? Um, a lot of times that for me requires just getting alone in solitude, perhaps a journal so I can write down any impressions that I have as, as I spend time in the Lord, uh, with the Lord in prayer and in the word. Uh, I write down those impressions, but it takes patience. I, I kind, of, kind of force it. Sometimes I'll pray. You may go for a run, uh, be mowing the lawn, and it's kind of that impression comes to you at a time that perhaps you don't expect. Doing dishes, vacuuming around the house, driving in the car, whatever it is. Just being open and patient for the Lord to speak in His timing. And finally, will you obey what the Holy Spirit says? But when God responds, will you obey? Or will you step out in presumption, prematurely, in your own decision making, according to your own wisdom, uh, to do what seems right in your own eyes? So this is really a challenge. This passage is a challenge to us that God has a plan. God has a purpose, even in the midst of trial. And he is working things above and beyond what we could ever envision or imagine. We need to trust him. We need to stay close to him. We need to pursue him with all of our heart. We need to spend time in the word and in prayer. And in doing so, just like in David's case, we can have assurance that God will work success in our situation. It might not be what we expect, but we can trust that it's what's best for us for eternity and it's what's best for us to grow into the image of Christ. It's what's best for us for the kingdom of God and the glory of God. And it's best for us in the long run. So I want you to encourage you to trust the Lord with whatever you're facing today, whatever decision, whatever issue, trial, difficulty, and to seek him through scripture. Let me pray for you as we conclude that the Lord's grace and blessing and spirit would be with you as you uh, step out this week to live your life before him. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word to encourage us through the examples of others who have gone before. Lord, I thank you for the life of David because he was a man who experienced many different difficulties and trials and, and, and suffering and pain and loss and hardship throughout his life. And we can learn so many valuable principles through the stories that are revealed to us in Scripture. And so, Lord, I am praying for every single person who is watching this video that they too would be encouraged. Holy Spirit, that you would speak directly into their situation by means of this message and of this passage of Scripture. And that you would direct them to continue to spend time in Scripture seeking you and give them a very clear and specific answer, guidance, or counsel as needed in your timing. Lord, help us to be patient. Help us to trust you in faith and build our relationship with you in the intimacy, the depth of relationship that we so desperately need to walk out every day in this, in this life. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Be with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, everyone. Bless you this week. And uh, look forward to more videos and sharing more truth with you as time allows.